let me welcome Dr. Kamani. Um, Dr. Kamani is a is a neurologist who is fellowship trained in neuromuscular disorders as well as movement disorders. Hello there, sir. Um, he practices at Swedish Medical Center here in Seattle, Washington. He is the author of a number of publications on Parkinson's disease. And, you know, frankly, he's an all around great guy. So we love having him as a speaker and sharing his vast knowledge of information. And he's a great friend to APDA. So welcome, Dr. Kamani. Thank you so much for being here. I am going to disappear. I will come back when we do questions and answers, and I am just going to leave the program up to you. So remember, folks, you can pose a question for Dr. Kamani at any time during the Q&A. So thank you so much for being here. I will see you at the conclusion of your presentation. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, hi, Jean. Um, Jean is also hosting the program, although you cannot see her. Um, I have to thank APDA for, for asking me to come back and, and talk to you guys about the autonomic nervous system. And, uh, and I thank you all for spending um, a part of your uh, Friday afternoon with us. Uh, so I'm gonna try to share my screen right now and uh, we'll start the presentation. Here we go. And if uh, you guys cannot see the screen, I'll just have, uh, Jen um, and or Jean pipe up and let me know. All right. So I thought I'd start with this beautiful scenery. It's summer and everyone's trying to get to the beaches and all of that. And I was in Newfoundland um, just about oh, a month and a half, two months ago. And uh, uh, this is just a random video I took of Cape Spear, which is the uh, easterly most point in North America. Uh, it's pretty wonderful. Um, the video is not that great. Uh, and, uh, uh, but anyway, it just gives you an idea of the vastness of, of the Atlantic Ocean and the east coast of Newfoundland, which is also infamously known as the coast off of which uh, the Titanic sank. But uh, that's, uh, that's all. Uh, fine and dandy. It's got nothing to do with the autonomic nervous system. Um, so we will proceed with the next slide, uh, which starts the lecture, if I'm able to advance my slides. There we go. So uh, initially, I had prepared a lecture on non-motor symptoms in Parkinson disease. That's a very long lecture because there are several non-motor symptoms. Um, uh, so today, what I would do is because we have about oh, 45, 50 minutes for this lecture and then q and I'll focus primarily on, um, on autonomic nervous system. Um, and then maybe at another time, we can talk about the other non-motor symptoms. So um, the fundamental role of the treatment of Parkinson um, disease is to ensure that the patient and caregiver uh, get all the support they need. Uh, and the more we practice, uh, uh, the more we realize that the neurologist or the movement disorder specialist cannot really do this on their own. They have to collaborate with uh, the patient's primary care doctor and other specialists. And the autonomic nervous system is, is um, uh, one of those very complex uh, uh, systems in the body uh, that really requires uh, a team to come together uh, to assist the patient and caregiver. Um, just yesterday, I was talking to Jen about generating a list of people in the community who can assist the, the movement disorder specialist in taking care of the patient effectively. These would include a cardiologist, perhaps an autonomic expert, a gastroenterologist, um, a urologist, um, and um, such, such a list is not readily available because there aren't too many specialists uh, who are familiar with Parkinson's disease. So I hope in the next a few years, we can educate not just patients, but communities of physicians and specialists and inspire them to, to partner um, with the movement disorder specialist to effectively take care uh, of patients and caregivers um, uh, with Parkinson's disease. 
the objectives of today's lectures are to review some of these non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, primarily the autonomic nervous system uh, uh, symptoms, as well as review treatment uh, for dysautonomia or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. In 2022, the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease is still based on recognizing cardinal motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, and uh, the way we do that in the clinic is to identify bradykinesia or slowness. Uh, this is a fundamental symptom of Parkinson's disease. And at least one of two of, uh, of the following symptoms, arrest tremor, or rigidity. Rigidity is stiffness of the muscle about a joint when you try to move it. Um, and so it, it, it is important to recognize that in, in this slide, nowhere do non-motor symptoms come into account, although non-motor symptoms are also an integral part of Parkinson's disease. And sometimes they are sort of left in the background while we focus primarily on the motor symptoms. Uh, in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, you see we've got exclusion criteria. In those exclusion criteria, you do have certain non-motor symptoms, which if present, um, allow you to exclude Parkinson's disease as, uh, as a cause. And one of them would be significant urinary retention, for example. So we do use non-motor symptoms uh, in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, uh, but the cardinal signs are still motor symptoms. Um, this slide, uh, a little busy, illustrates the wide prevalence of non-motor symptoms throughout the body. And non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's disease occur due to a dysfunction or impairment of what we call end organs. The end organs uh, include the eye, the nose, mouth, uh, you know, heart, um, uh, including the intestine, the bladder, and the genitourinary system. Um, and, and the reason this happens is because there are nerves that go down from the brain and spinal cord to control all of these end organs. And it is those nerves uh, that are affected in Parkinson's disease. The organs themselves are functioning well. Uh, it, it is not like Parkinson's disease causes um, uh, for instance, like cancer, uh, you know, um, a, a disruption of uh, the, uh, the mucosa or the lining of the intestine or other inflammatory diseases like Crohn disease, or ulcerative colitis. Uh, the problem is not with the end organ as much as it is with the nerves that control the end organ, because at the end of the day, Parkinson's disease is a purely neurological disease. Um, and the list of symptoms uh, that non-motor symptoms that are caused or that can be recognized include symptoms in the realm of sleep, psychiatric disturbance, cognitive disturbance, uh, pain and fatigue, visual symptoms. I put that uh, in in, um, in lowercase or in smaller font, because we are not going to spend a lot of time talking about visual symptoms, although they are important. And then a whole set of symptoms, uh, which we say are the autonomic nervous system symptoms. All of these symptoms impair quality of life. Uh, but today's focus is going to be on talking about cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, and the genitourinary and sexual symptoms. Uh, and I'd like to break it down. But before I do that, I'd like to uh, just tell you uh, briefly about the anatomy of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is comprised of three parts uh, that are commonly recognized with uh, distinct but connected functions, sympathetic system, the parasympathetic system, and the myenteric plexus, which is the least understood and I believe the most complex part of the autonomic system. This is a large complex network 
of nerves uh, that control the gut, sometimes also called the brain of the gut. Um, so let's look at a couple cartoons over here. The sympathetic system is commonly known as that which regulates the fight or flight response. Um, and uh, this, this cartoon over here illustrates a section of the brain as if you're looking at it uh, from the front, which is connected to the brain stem here and the spinal cord. Um, and the, the sympathetic system is usually what we call a three chain system. Um, the first chain uh, of, of neurons comes from the hypothalamus and brainstem and other brain areas, and it connects to various little uh, clusters of cells in the spinal cord. Uh, and the nerves from those clusters of cells in the spinal cord project to uh, a, a chain of a ganglia. A ganglia is a fancy term for a collection of cells. There, these nerves synapse or talk to these ganglia. And then the third chain is nerves that connect these ganglia to these end organs. So these are your autonomic nerves that come out and control uh, the size of the lens, for, for example, in the eye. Um, and the heartbeat or beat to beat rhythm is if you will, um, the, in fact, even secretion of epinephrine from the adrenal medulla, uh, the uh, storage and emptying of the bladder, the movement of the gut, uh, this is the intestine over here, um, and sweating um, and uh, things like that by controlling uh, the diameter of uh, blood vessels. Um, and to balance it, balance the sympathetic system out, we have um, the parasympathetic system, which we will talk about in just a bit. In Parkinson's disease, there's a degeneration of some of these brain structures which send nerves down to the spinal cord, but also there's a degeneration of some of these peripheral autonomic nerves that uh, control these various end organs. The parasympathetic system um, balances out the sympathetic system. It's um, almost like a yeah, um, uh, it's almost like a seesaw that's kept uh, in uh, that's kept level uh, by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system. Sometimes the sympathetic system um, is more active than parasympathetic system, and sometimes the parasympathetic system is more active than sympathetic systems, which allows fine control of the organs of the body. And so this is a, this particular control is important for all bodily functions. Uh, the parasympathetic system, like the sympathetic system, has the first set of nerves that come from the hypothalamus, brainstem, and other uh, brain areas. But these particular nerves synapse in different cell clusters in the brainstem and the spinal cord. Uh, so uh, there is a separation uh, of uh, the anatomy of the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system, uh, which allows them to function independently, but, th but also in a connected fashion, uh, because they uh, innervate or control some of the same organs, such as the parasympathetic system through, by way of cranial nerves here, three, seven, nine, and 10, control the eye, control the parotid and the submandibular glands. Uh, the vagus nerve, which is the largest cranial nerve, um, innervates um, the, the nodes of the heart. It innervates the opening and closing um, of the, the sphincters in the gut, uh, also um, nerves from the sacral area, uh, the lumbosacral or sacral area, uh, innervate or uh, control bladder function um, and the rectal function, etc. Uh, so uh, it is important to recognize um, that these two systems work very well together every microsecond um, of the day to, to control bodily to control our bodily functions. Moving to the um, myenteric um, uh, plexus, um, uh, just before that, I would say that even in the parasympathetic system of in Parkinson's disease, there is a degeneration of um, these higher brain centers as well as the, the peripheral nerves uh, that um, 
that control these various organs. Uh, so we can find pathology in, in both of these areas, um, which tells us that, uh, that in Parkinson's disease, there's a degeneration of various parts of the nervous system, not just the midbrain dopaminergic neurons that produce dopamine. And we know that because giving dopamine, uh, it does not really improve autonomic symptoms very well. And I thought that this was a fun slide that illustrates the complexity of the myenteric plexus. When I did my literature search for this talk, I really wasn't finding good images or pictures of the myenteric plexus. And that is because the myenteric plexus um, is, is present at the cellular uh, level in epithelial uh, tissue of the gut. And it is difficult to draw a cartoon of it like we did of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. This is a YouTube video by this extremely articulate physician called Dr. Zach Murphy. Uh, and I found it and he, he uh, proceeds to draw the myenteric plexus, um, which is just such a complex set of neurons and nerves that talk to each other and they contact various blood vessels and the epithelial tissue of, of the gut that, you know, I'd have to spend hours and hours understanding this, although this was taught to us at, at, at in medical school. Uh, but it, it just uh, it tells you about how complex the system and it is not very well understood. And that's why uh, disorders of the gut that involve the myenteric plexus are, are quite difficult and challenging um, to treat. Oh, okay. So before I jump right into the discussion, this is a lovely aerial view of um, the Acadia National Forest in Maine. And if you haven't been, I would highly recommend it. Um, so let's start with dysautonomia or a dysfunction of the autonomic system. I broke it down into uh, four parts. Uh, the, uh, the first part we will talk about is neurogenic orthostatic hypotension or NOH. We'll talk briefly about constipation. We'll talk about lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs, and then briefly touch upon sexual dysfunction due to dysautonomia. One of the most common symptoms uh, we encounter in Parkinson's disease um, is constipation. Uh, constipation occurs almost universally in Parkinson's disease at various times. It doesn't exist in everyone at the same time. Now, constipation has a specific definition, which is straining or having less than three bowel movements per week, feeling of inadequate emptying, heart stools, feeling of obstruction, and also using manual uh, maneuvers to have a bowel movement um, at least 25% of the time um, in, in your life, uh, more frequently in Parkinson's disease. And constipation is such a ubiquitous uh, uh, gastrointestinal issue uh, uh, that almost everyone has experienced it at some point or the other. But in Parkinson's disease, it's prevalent, it's persistent, and it can be progressive unless treated um, adequately on a day-to-day on -day basis. <clears throat> uh, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension also has a specific uh, definition. The fundamental quality of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is lightheadedness upon standing, which is very common in the world, but much more so in Parkinson's disease. This happens because when you stand, there is a drop in blood pressure. In Parkinson's disease, the heart rate does not increase adequately. So the heart is not able to pump faster uh, to push blood up to the brain. And the lightheadedness is caused due to the brain not getting enough blood. And the reason the, the heart is not able to pump faster uh, is because of autonomic dysfunction. The autonomic nerves uh, that control the heart are degenerating. And those are the nerves that are responsible for increasing heart rate. And any other person who does not have Parkinson's disease, um, when they stand and their blood pressure drops. Uh, and if you want specific numbers, uh, or neurogenic orthostatic tension is defined as at least a 15 millimeter drop in systolic blood pressure or a 10 millimeter drop in diastolic blood pressure after three minutes of standing. 
but without a commensurate increase in heart rate of more than 15 beats per minute. Not everyone is out of the textbook. Um, so this definition may not be satisfied in everyone. Plus it also depends on when you take your blood pressure. Um, but this is the, the technical definition of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. So uh, let's talk about constipation first. Constipation is due to many things, but in Parkinson's disease, there is reduced gut motility. This picture over here shows you a um, carbidopa levodopa pill that is stuck in the stomach for hours because the, the gut or the, the part of the stomach is not moving and emptying itself into the intestine. And this condition is called gastroparesis. It is not specific to Parkinson's disease. It can occur in a number of conditions. And the most common condition is diabetes because diabetes also causes dysautonomia uh, by different mechanisms, um, uh, such as what we see in Parkinson's disease. But the problem with the gut not moving or the stomach not emptying its contents is of course, that feeling of bloating, um, that feeling of the stomach being full. And, and importantly, in the medicines not making their way down to the intestine, which is where they're absorbed. So when a patients come to us complaining of wearing off, um, which is a return of motor symptoms before the next dose is due, in addition to, to ensuring that they're taking an adequate amount of medications at adequate times, it is important to ensure that their stomach is moving because what if the, the medicine is stuck in the stomach for hours uh, and it is, not, uh, it is not getting to the intestine, then you would wear off because uh, if the medicine is not, in, is not absorbed, you don't get the benefit of the medication. So, so we also have to keep in mind gastroparesis when we are talking about wearing off. Um, what are the other conditions that can worsen constipation other than gastroparesis? Uh, helicopylori infections are common and they need to be, they should be looked at. There are several medications, including beta blockers, um, iron, salts, um, uh, and uh, cardiovascular medications and antidepressants that can slow the gut down. And so one needs to take stock of those medications to ensure that they are being dosed appropriately. Uh, when, when, when we encounter persistent constipation, we have to look at common things like structural lesions. So people need to have their endoscopies and colonoscopies on a regular basis to make sure there is no lesion, no cancers, no palps, none of that, that is worsening constipation. We talked about gastroparetic disorders such as diabetes. And then there are a whole bunch of um, uh, malabsorption syndromes that are relatively rare. The, this, um, these syndromes are due to um, genetic disorders or inflammation of the of the intestine um, that can coexist with Parkinson's disease. Uh, in terms of Parkinson's disease, uh, what we have found, and this is from autopsy studies, is that myenteric plexus or the brain of the gut is dysfunctional. Uh, and, and the reason is there is, uh, as we talked about, a degeneration of the higher brain centers, including um, uh, the vagus nerve and the nucleus or uh, its origin and other uh, uh, centers in the brain stem. And so how would you treat constipation and Parkinson's disease? You still have to go back to basics. You must do a general medical examination, ensure that there is no other cause for constipation. And this is where you want to partner with the primary doctor and the gastrointestinal specialist. Um, how about hydration, hydration, hydration? You know, we sound like a broken record in our clinic. We talk about this incessantly, particularly uh, these days when the temperature is 90. Uh, as Jen said, we have a heat wave, even more important to be hydrated uh, than ever before. And then we have over the counter. Uh, uh, over-the-counter uh, agents or over-the-counter drugs uh, that we talk about uh, in our clinic, including fiber supplements, um, bulkers, osmotics, 
and prokinetics. These are just fancy terms for things like psyllium, uh, things like uh, polyethylene glycol or Miralax, uh, things that increase water in the gut. And prokinetics are those that actually move the gut or cause peristalsis. One of the prokinetics, which is commonly given in the hospital and by gastrointestinal specialists is metoclopramide. This is a huge no-no in Parkinson's disease. You must avoid it at all costs. Although you may move your gut, Parkinson's disease itself might get significantly worse because it is a form of dopamine blocker. If none of the -the over-the-counter supplements work, then we recommend polyethylene glycol, or it's also called Miralax. In fact, you may not want to do fibers, bulkers, osmotics, and prokinetics and directly go to Miralax. And um, uh, more recently, we've had a lot of studies that show that probiotics and prebiotic um, supplements do significantly improve constipation, um, not just general constipation in the public, but constipation in Parkinson's disease. Lubiprostone I put up over there because it was the only um, laxative, if you will, that was studied uh, for Parkinson's disease. Now there are many others, but if none of the non-pharmacological, non-prescription um, modalities work for treatment of constipation, then lubiprostone could be one of those that could be prescribed by either your neurologist or your primary doctor uh, to see if that helps with um, refractory or troublesome constipation. Uh, switching gears to neurogenic orthostatic hypotension or that symptom of lightheadedness. Before we, we talk about, uh, about this particular symptom in detail, one first needs to ensure that it is present. Why? Because the cause of lightheadedness is, is really uh, causes are myriad. Lightheadedness can be due to a low blood pressure. Lightheadedness can be due to vestibular dysfunction. Uh, uh, lightheadedness can be um, uh, due to uh, you know, heart-related disease, high lightheadedness can be due to pulmonary diseases, anemia, etc. Uh, so it is important uh, that before we attribute uh, lightheadedness to neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, everyone again needs to have um, a general medical examination to exclude those other causes of lightheadedness. And what makes it more complex is those other causes may coexist with Parkinson's disease. So before we, we find out if someone is, someone is having neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, one needs to measure the blood pressure because we have a definition for it. And the way I do it in my clinic is to have people keep a seven, five to seven day blood pressure diary. And this is the way you do it. You measure the blood pressure and heart rate in bed first thing in the morning as you're laying down without standing up or sitting up, and then you can carefully stand up uh, with the help of your caregiver, wait about three minutes, and then measure the blood pressure and heart rate. And you do this for about a week, and then you review the readings with the doctor. And it tells you that everyone with Parkinson's disease should have an accurate blood pressure cuff at home because this particular symptom is so ubiquitous that you may need to use your, uh, your blood pressure um, uh, of cuff um, you know, on and off if you are lightheaded. Um, and I do have some suggestions for patients in my clinic on which blood pressure cuff to buy. Of course, the blood pressure cuff needs to be calibrated well so you can take it to your doctor's office, or you can have it calibrated based upon what the manufacturer says. One of the blood pressure cuffs is called Omron, and it is an automatic uh, wrist pressure cuff, which also measures and stores the readings. So once you basically measure this, you, and you establish that neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is present. That is when someone is standing up, their blood pressure drops, but their heart rate does not increase. All you need is one or two readings to demonstrate that you can diagnose neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. The first thing we got to do is to review the medications people take because one of the most common causes of orthostatic hypotension is pills that we give people. And one of the most common kind of pills we give people are antihypertensives, those that are given for essential hypertension, which is, again, a very, very common disease in the world. And if you give too much, too much 
or a lot of essential uh, antihypertensives you can cause low blood pressure because that's what they're designed to do, lower the blood pressure. Um, and so, uh, you know, we need to do a thorough examination of pills people are taking. And then we move on to other non-pharmacological measures once we, uh, once we address the medications people are taking. And these include increasing fluid, uh, salting your food, compression stockings, abdominal binders, and some exercises that physical therapists can teach people to raise the blood pressure up in the standing, walking, or exercising position. It is important to ensure that the neurologist communicates with the primary doctor, which I always say, and there is a caveat, if your heart is not functioning well, if your kidneys are not functioning well, there may be a limitation on the amount of fluid and salt you can take. And in that case, when someone has kidney or heart problems, I always communicate or I defer management to the kidney doctor and the cardiologist because one needs to get clearance from them on the amount of salt and fluid um, someone with heart trouble or kidney trouble can take. If all of that doesn't work, we explore pharmacological measures. Droxydopa is squared and red here because currently it's the only FDA, FDA approved medicine for treating orthostatic hypotension and Parkinson's disease, diabetes, uh, multiple system atrophy, et cetera. However, it is difficult to get. Um, it takes authorizations, appeals, and you all know what that process looks like. Uh, so in a pinch, if you really need assistance right away, we use other medications such as fludrocortisone, which is a mineralocorticoid or a steroid. It's important that when we use fludrocortisone, uh, potassium levels be managed uh, or measured because it can lower levels of potassium. Midodrine has been around for a very long time. It also needs to be dosed carefully. Peridostigmine is not commonly used um, in the clinic, although I think it should be. It can decrease blood pressure fluctuations up and down, but it must be dosed carefully because it can reduce heart rate as well. So if someone has a low, low resting heart rate, we may not want to give them peridostigmine. Um, and then we, we sometimes have to use a combination of pharmacological measures. I have several patients in my clinic that need more than one drug, fluorocortisine, metadrine, droxydopa, as well uh, to, uh, to treat very severe neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, and um, this particular problem can come and go. There can be months in which you don't and, and, and in other days in which it can be fairly severe. What makes neurogenic orthostatic hypotension particularly challenging to treat is the coexistence of something called supine hypertension. Uh, just as when you stand up, your blood pressure drops. When you lay down in Parkinson's disease, the blood pressure can shoot up to dangerous levels. That's why we say uh, to people with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, please raise the head of your bed by 30 degrees or nine inches. Uh, this is difficult. It can be uncomfortable and you might have to look for appropriate risers, but this is, this is important because this may prevent damage from sudden spikes of high blood pressure when you lay flat. And so laying flat is a big no-no and putting two pillows under your head is really doesn't work. You really have to raise the head of your bed. Um, and um, we talked about droxydopa briefly. It's important to recognize that droxydopa, like all other medications, can have side effects, including headache, nausea, dizziness. In fact, for some reason, it can make dizziness worse. Um, and of course, it can cause high blood pressure. Rarely, it can cause blood pressure high enough that it can cause nosebleeds. I haven't come across anyone thus far uh, who has had brain bleeds from droxydopa and high blood pressure, but one needs to be careful about that because you don't want your blood pressure to go up too high either. And then we talked about midotrine and fludrocortisone. If patients have complicated cardiovascular or renal or kidney issues, then I do, um, I do refer them to other specialists um, and then partner with the other specialists in the treatment of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Moving on um, to a bladder function, I'm just going to quickly look at my watch to ensure I'm staying on time. Um, 
there is this acronym that urologists use called lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs. Uh, this happens um, or bladder symptoms occur in Parkinson's disease due to bladder hyperreflexia or spasms. This is called neurogenic bladder. Uh, and this results in frequent urination at night called nocturia and increased frequency and urgency during the day. But it typically in Parkinson's disease, urinary retention is not common. If people are if retaining urine, uh, especially in men, prostate size uh, or prostate exam needs to be done. Other causes of urinary retention uh, need to be looked at. Urinary retention is the inability to urinate when going to the bathroom. Uh, the bladder has two fundamental functions. One is storage, appropriate storage, and then is the appropriate excretion of, um, of urine or called voiding. And in Parkinson's disease, it is the storage part which is not working well. Uh, the bladder is not supposed to spasm. The urge to urinate should occur uh, only after the bladder is filled to a certain level. Otherwise, we'd all be running to the bathroom all the time. So there is an inbuilt mechanism to quiet the bladder down until the bladder is filled to a certain amount, at which point uh, you have to go urinate. In Parkinson's disease, that, that regulatory control of quieting the bladder down is gone. And that is due to dysautonomia because uh, autonomic nerves are responsible for quieting the bladder down, and autonomic nerves are responsible for making the bladder spasm, which creates that urge to urinate. And that's what's going on in Parkinson's disease. So when that happens, I, I tell people, because urinary tract and symptoms are so common and so ubiquitous, whether you have Parkinson's disease or not, that at least in men, they need to have a regular prostate check. In fact, we have found people who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease who come to our clinic who have difficulty with urination. And when we have sent them to the urologist, the primary doctor, we found that they've had a very large prostate state that they were unaware of that is causing the problem. In women, obviously, there is, uh, you know, uh, prostate is not an issue. Um, and so in women, we tell, we tell them that we need to see a urogynecologist. And if the problem is chronic, uh, because in women, um, uh, in frequency, urgency, and incontinence can be common due to a variety of reasons, then we should partner with the urologist and the primary care physician to see how we can quieten the spasms of the bladder. In women, there can be other measures that can be taken, uh, including um, pessaries, et cetera, if there is a bladder prolapse. Cystoscopy is a procedure uh, which is used by urologists to look at bladder function, the filling and the voiding part. And this, this becomes an important exam uh, to ensure that there isn't another cause for LUTs. Um, in terms of non-pharmacological treatment for bladder dysfunction, um, there are various things that can be done. I just mentioned pessaries in women for bladder prolapse, uh, and then neurorehabilitation and behavioral changes. And um, uh, one of the simple commonsensical things is to restrict a lot of fluids a few hours before bedtime. Kegel exercises can strengthen the puborectalis muscle and uh, can prevent leakage. And then, of course, you've got urinary garments when you're up and about and if you're concerned about, about leakage. Um, and... Um, uh, in very few cases, um, surgery is needed if it is uh, a surgical problem. One uncommon thing that occurs or maybe understudied thing is a condition called pressure dry diuresis. Pressure is pressure. Diuresis is the fancy term uh, for urination. This can happen when blood pressure spikes at night when you're sleeping. When, the, when blood pressure is high, it sets up a, uh, a, a biochemical and a mechanical reaction in the body, which makes you want to go pee very frequently. Uh, and uh, that can be treated uh, by ensuring blood pressure doesn't spike too much during the night uh, when you're sleeping. It's a complex problem because 
um, you don't necessarily want to give a lot of blood pressure medications at night because then when you wake up in the morning, you could be extremely lightheaded. So uh, one needs to partner with the cardiologist or the primary doctor to maybe give a very, very small dose of antihypertensive at night to reduce blood pressure at night, which reduces pressure diuresis, uh, uh, causing frequency and urgency of urination. When none of these uh, rehabilitation behavioral changes work, we do turn to pharmacological treatment. The first point on this slide is important. Anticholinergics are those medications that are, that are very widely used. In an anticholinergic, uh, the drug itself de decreases the, the secretion of acetylcholine. I did not mention in the, in the initial slides when talking about the autonomic nervous system that there are two fundamental neurotransmitters that work the autonomic nervous system. They include acetylcholine and norepinephrine. And acetylcholine is, is a, a molecule that can act on the bladder to make it spasm. And it is controlled by the parasympathetic autonomic system. So drugs have been, have been designed to block the effect of acetylcholine. But unfortunately, a lot of these drugs also cross into the brain and block the effect of acetylcholine in the brain. And that's not good because acetylcholine is a very important molecule that allows you to think clearly that is responsible for attention and concentration. So it is not uncommon to see people who, with Parkinson's disease who have been given uh, anticholinergics talking about having brain fog, talking about not being able to think clearly. In fact, uh, anticholinergics can make constipation worse. Um, so we, try, we want to try to avoid anticholinergics as best as possible. And truly, whether you have Parkinson's disease or not, these drugs can do a number on your brain, particularly if you're over age 65. Um, the two medications that have known to be beneficial in treatment of lower urinary tract sy symptoms include salafenacin and mirabegron. Um, these are specialized medications that act at the level of the bladder. They don't cross into uh, the brain as much and cause brain fog, etc. But, uh, um, you know, as we expect, these medicines are difficult to get. They're very expensive. They need to be obtained from, uh, <clears throat> from uh, special pharmacies, sometimes primary doctors and urologists, <coughs> I'm sorry, have better luck in obtaining these medications than neurologists. So again, partnering with the urologist is important. Um, uh, so uh, th this, th th this particular issue of bladder problems and lower urinary tract symptoms also requires a multimodal approach, including uh, ensuring that you're seeing the appropriate specialists. Um, this might be my last slide, um, I think. Um, the last slide is about sexual dysfunction. Um, in Parkinson's disease, 75% um, of men and women report sexual dys dysfunction of some sort or the other. Uh, this can be due to a variety of reasons, but specifically where the autonomic, symptom, uh, autonomic system is concerned, a men, may, a men may report of erectile difficulty, ejaculation problems, and orgasmia, and women uh, control of vaginal dryness, decreased libido, and orgasmia. Again, you don't need to have Parkinson's disease to have these problems. So it is important to again involve the urologist uh, to ensure that there isn't anything else going on causing sexual dysfunction. One of the most common causes of sexual dysfunction in the world is medications. There are several medications that can cause sexual dysfunction. So one needs to look at the medications that, that we are taking. Common medications causing sexual dysfunction include statin medications antidepressant, propranolol, or beta blockers. Um, and, so, so, and the reason why it's important to look at those medications carefully is when you stop those medications or change them or reduce the dose, sexual dysfunction can be reversible. 
Uh, and in Parkinson's disease specifically, it is autonomic dysfunction. And there is a class of medications that is used to overcome some of these issues. And uh, we know them as Viagra, Sildenafil, and Cialis. One of the cautions with these medications is that they expand um, the, the diameter of arteries to let more blood into the genital urinary A. Uh, gentle urinary area, but they also expand artery, arterial diameter everywhere else, and expanding the arterial diameter can cause your blood pressure to plummet. So it's not uncommon to have symptoms of orthostatic hypotension worsen significantly when one is using sildenafil or Cialis. So one needs to be careful with that. And of course, if you have heart issues and all of that, you need to be careful. So when I have a patient with complex medical problems, I would like to, uh, to take a urological consultation to figure out if there is a medication that can help them or if there are other conditions that are causing sexual dysfunction. Um, and I'm looking at my watch. I think it is 10 2. I suppose this is my last slide. I've got several others that I can talk about, but I might just want to pause here and take some questions. I'd like to end with this lovely picture of the Portland headlight. This is from one of my trips in coastal Maine. If you haven't been, um, I recommend it. Um, uh, it is a lovely place to go to um, and, uh, you know, to spend a couple summer days. So uh, with that, I would like to um, minimize my slides over here and I will hand it over to um, Jen. Let me stop sharing over here. Uh, Jean, are you there? Can you enable my video, please? And then I will come on the screen. And while we work that out, for some reason, we have these uh, things. Thank you for sharing your trip slides. You know, I'm a traveler. I love to see those things. And this is a serious topic, and it gives a little lightness to the whole presentation. So thank you. I appreciate it. I hope other people do. We have a lot of questions from the audience. Jen, um, yes. how do I enable your video for you? <laughs> I don't know. Try to go to me and enable. My, I mean, I can just talk from the background too. I don't I'll know. Work on it. Keep okay. talking. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so we do have a number of questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to try to organize them, but I might, it might not be in an organized manner. So um, let's do some clarifying questions for some of the things that you talked about. Um you mentioned uh, recommended blood pressure devices um, and how and when to calibrate. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, and is there a preference between a wrist cuff and an upper arm style or is, is there not a preference there? Whatever works for them. Yeah, whatever works for people, whatever is convenient to use is recommended. You can calibrate these devices uh, yes, Hi, can, I, I made it. Sorry. <laughs> we can calibrate. You can calibrate these devices by taking them into your primary care, um, a primary care doctor's office. Now, it is important that their devices be calibrated because um, one of the problems we notice in our clinics is our own devices might be faulty. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is important to ensure that their devices are calibrated. And what, that's one of the reasons why I don't measure these blood pressures in our office, because people are anxious, they're nervous, uh, you know, their blood pressure may be high and they don't give accurate readings in your home environment. It's much easier to measure blood pressure. They don't have all of those stressors, but you can do that through your primary care doctor's office to see if there is a difference between your cuff your reading and their reading, and then you know the delta, but it is important, uh, or the difference, it's important to, to ensure that their blood cr pressure cuff itself is accurate. Okay, great, thank you. And you mentioned um, a class of drugs, the metoclopramid, <laughs> I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna mutilate it. Um, uh, how we, what commercial brand names um, does that go by? Do you know, or should they just Google it or? Well, one of the most um, popular brand is Reglan, R-E-G-L-A-N. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the commercial brand name of this particular medication, which is actually not a bad medication in people who don't have Parkinson's disease. 
Mm -hmm. Um, It is used very commonly and it is a powerful medication and very effective in moving the gut. Very commonly used after surgeries. Because when you have surgery, you have to mobilize fluid, you have to make the patient get up and move and all of that, Uh, but that may take some time. And so so surgeons might give patients right gland to move their gut after surgery uh, to have a bowel movement, but not certainly cannot do it and should not do it in people with Parkinson's disease. Okay, okay. Um, And I I would guess that if you have questions about some of these specific drug things is a pharmacist is a really great resource for that. Would you agree with that? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Your doctor, of course, but a pharmacist is a a great one to talk to. Um, You had mentioned avoiding anticholinergics. Um, Examples of commonly prescribed ones for those? Yeah, there's one called ditropan. It's very commonly uh, prescribed anticholinergics, and there are others as well. Um, and uh, if you're if you're concerned about that and you want to um, look it up, uh, one of the things is you can do it yourself. But the other thing is you can do is you can ask your uh, pharmacist when you're picking up the medication, "Hey, what class of medications is this? Is this an anticholinergic?" Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily a no-no because if you have very severe frequency, urgency, and leakage, you might need a touch of an anticholinergic, but at least be cognizant of the fact that if you begin to have side effects after you start it, then you can say, oh, you know, this is potentially related to the medication because it's the side effects started after I started taking the medication. There's a whole host of people who don't have side effects either. Uh, from these medications, but it's just it's it's uh, it's it's important to just be aware of the side effect of side effects of this particular class of medications. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to try to address some NOH questions. Um, this attendee asks: I seem to be okay when standing up from sitting. However, I can be standing at the kitchen counter preparing food and end up on the floor. Everything they hear about NOH is sitting to standing. Um, is this a symptom of NOH or is it something different that they need to get checked out? One of the fundamental questions one asks in this scenario is where you lightheaded when you fell. Uh, mm-hmm. that, is, it, that is really important because most people with, with OH or NOH are symptomatic. Uh, and if the patient says, no, I just fell without being lightheaded, then you have to look at other causes, hip, knee, ankle is the Parkinson's disease wearing off and one needs to be put it put it into context but to answer the initial question yes because as you're standing for long periods of time the same autonomic system uh, that pumps your blood up from your feet your legs up to your brain is not working and blood is pooling uh, in your thighs and in your legs. So standing for a long duration of time can absolutely precipitate OH symptoms and you faint. This is what we have seen in soldiers who are standing out of the heat for a long time. They go plunk, and that is because blood is pooling in their feet. Uh, They're dehydrated. There's not enough blood going to the brain. So yes, you can absolutely have uh, NOH or light OH, let's call it orthostatic hypotensives, uh, systems, any uh, uh, dysfunction when you're sitting, standing, walking, or standing for a long period of time. So measuring your blood pressure in a variety of situations probably is beneficial? Yes. Once Mm -hmm. you establish that you have uh, low blood pressure, uh, it can be easily done by that mechanism of laying down and standing up. You Mm -hmm. can use that information in various settings. So therefore, it may not be feasible, but I have patients who are sitting and cooking. They're not standing and cutting vegetables. Uh, Your stove Mm -hmm. may not allow you to do that, but when you're sitting and doing things, you have less of a chance of falling down to the ground and hurting yourself. Okay, great, great. Um, So does... I'm going to mutilate another drug name. They name them really weird. Does propranolol aggravate or cause NOH? And is it safe to take with cinnamon? Yes, absolutely. Propranolol is a drug that lowers blood pressure and heart rate. And the problem with NOH is low blood pressure and low heart rate. And the propranolol is a big no-no. 
However, I would not recommend, this is not a prescriptive lecture, so please don't go home and throw out all your pills. That is not the point of this, because propranolol can be a life-saving drug in people with heart attacks, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and it's in, and uh, supraventricular tachycardia, uh, and uh, tons of propranolol has a wide variety of uses. So you, you're not allowed to stop your medication suddenly. You must talk to um, your, your prescribing doctor if you have symptoms of OH and then ask them, hey, is there a uh, alternative to propranolol? Uh, you know, so that's, it's critically important to understand that drugs are double-edged swords, right? They can help you significantly in one way, but harm you in other ways as well. So they need to be used judiciously. All these drugs are being given to you by doctors who want to help you. Yeah. Uh, this is very important to recognize. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, one more NOH question so far, I think. Um, I travel often. Well, this is sort of NOH related. I travel often. So raising the bed really high up is often a problem. Um, is using two pillows a no-no for blood pressure issues? And is, do you have any other alternative suggestions with that? Yeah, there's um, someone asked me this question and I believe they're making inflatable wedges, uh, oh. which, may, which, may, which may be one thing that you can use. The other thing is to, if you're going to hotels, you put in a request earlier saying, I need a wedge, I have a condition. And huh. just like you asked them, I need non-synthetic sheets or whatever. Hotels help you accommodate that. They have disability rooms in which they have hospital beds and all of that. So a lot of times due to the ADA's excellent effect, uh, uh, efforts, you have a lot of the provisions if you let the hotels know ahead of time. If you're going camping uh, and a whole bunch of other outdoorsy places, that might be limited. But if you're going camping, you take your wedge with you. you know, right, to right. The truck or something you're like doing that. a lot of sleeping in tents, aren't you, Dr. Kamani? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> we've talked about that before, yeah. but if you are, take your wedge. <laughs> yeah, you need it. Exactly. Yeah. So make some provisions ahead of time, but I do understand, uh, you know, uh, the person's problem. If you're, if you're traveling so much, you first want to travel light and then taking wedges and it is extremely, uh, you know, problematic. So yes, two pillows is fine. Make sure your neck doesn't get, um, you know, you have to be just careful about your neck. People who have neck issues cannot just prop themselves on two pillows or a wedge. So I always mm -hmm. uh, get the occupational therapist involved to say, hey, what wedge would be good for this person with neck problems? Yeah, great, great. All right, one more came in on NOH um, or OH. Um, how do you handle that when taking a walk outside? Walking po poles or other devices that you recommend? Do you rec what do you recommend for that? Uh, for, for treatment of NOH, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, one of the things is uh, just depends on how bad the uh, bad uh, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is. If someone is really active um, and is having severe NOH, the medications that I describe should work in all situations. Okay. One of the things that you have to understand is these medications are not going to work if your fluid tank is empty. They're just not. So if you're if these medications are not working, that, that means your tank is is empty. That itself is going to cause a high blood pressure. You know, it's like telling the medications to raise fluid pressure, which is what they're trying to do when there isn't enough fluid in the body. Mm -hmm. And so drinking the, the, the water and again, you don't want to overdo it with water. <laughs> I've had a couple of people who have had so much water that their sodium dropped. And that's not a good thing. And that, that will end you up in the hospital as well. So the two liters of water every day, if you can do that, is going to help you when you're walking. The medications are going to help you. And something else that helps people a lot is an abdominal binder. Mm. Now, sometimes we have to do a combination of things. You know, if the, if the NOH is so bad, we got to use the medications and use the abdominal binder when people are up and about. Okay. Great. So let's move on to gastrointestinal questions. Um, you had mentioned use of probiotics. Are there, there's a vast amount out there. Some are good, some are not so good. Do you have a particular strain that you recommend? 
Again, this is a very common question. In that particular trial that they studied, it was a generic brand and there was no mention of a particular uh, generic uh, probiotic. There was no mention of a particular brand. Uh, so you'd have to use your judgment. Nothing. There is no statement by any medical association that says this particular probiotic is excellent. Uh, there's mm -hmm. none of that. So I, I do believe that you can get away with using a standard uh, probiotic or prebiotic Philips mix culturel that that's very commonly used. And then there are people I don't I, I don't pay a lot of stock. I don't put a lot of stock into people saying my pro probiotic has a has a billion zillion flora so it's going to be a hundred bucks uh, i that is i think that is that truly is um is an exaggerated claim you know mm -hmm. it's just like the pillow guy who says my pillow can make you sleep better which is completely <laughs> bunkus so you know anyway, i just want to put it out there uh mm -hmm. that yes so just take the the um uh, you know averagely priced uh a probiotic or capsule or prebiotic per day. There's no need to spend hundreds of dollars on these claims of, uh, you know, having all these flora. Uh, and truly, it may be a um, it may be a trial and error process. And with uh -huh. constipation, what works for someone else doesn't work for another person. That's why support groups are fantastic. And that's why I love the APDA, because you bring people together in forums. You know, you guys do that and say, hey, y'all, what's working for your constipation? And there'll be three hands saying, I love this probiotic. I would actually mm -hmm. learn a lot from those support groups um, and then me telling people. So the work that you do in bringing people together and basically stimulating discussion should be able to answer a few of these questions, I think. And then you can yeah. share it with the physicians, actually. <laughs> OK, OK. Yeah, we, that that is true. Support groups are a wealth of good sharing of information, sometimes accurate, most of the time accurate, sometimes a little funky. But anyway, yeah. thank you. Um, and I also would mention that um, there was a great presentation by a gastroenterologist who's a specialist um, that is posted on the APDA YouTube channel. And he talks a lot about different like probiotics and strands, but he talks a lot about prebiotics, which you can get through food, like fermented food, like kimchi. And, you know, so looking into those prebiotic things, so you don't even have to go buy a supplement. You can get it through some of your food sources. Um, so check that out on the APDA website if you want, or YouTube channel, I guess. Um, That's some really good information. I'd like to review that and maybe give that to my patients. Yeah, I'll send that to you. It was a really great presentation. Oh, and there's just not that many specialists in Parkinson's who understand gastroenterological. I cannot speak today, but understand these issues. So, uh, yeah, um, I know that we're um, at our over the hour mark. But if you have time, I'll continue to go through questions um, for a little bit longer. Um, and of course, people on Zoom can jump off when they need to go. So but, you know, there are some questions that are that are. I think we want to get answered here. So are you okay with that? Uh, yes, sure. Okay. Um, so is magnesium appropriate for treating constipation? Uh, yes. Yeah, so magnesium, 250 to 500 milligrams, elemental magnesium is fine uh, mm -hmm. to treat constipation. Um, and as a matter of fact, magnesium is good to reduce headaches as well. It has mm. been approved as a treatment for migraine headaches as a supplement. It takes a couple months to act, uh, but it's, yes, it's important because, and why, why do I mention headaches is because um, constipation can, um, can temporarily cause a big spike of blood pressure in your brain when you're straining. That can mm. cause headaches. So there's a couple of reasons why constipation is, is not good. I didn't get into this too much, but uh, I think I did a little bit that you don't absorb your carbidopa levodopa. Uh, when you're constipated and, and the medicine is not moving through the gut, magnesium should help with that. Yeah. Okay. And another, so this, this person takes um, like one to one and a half, one and a half to two capfuls of Mir Miralax a day for constipation and it helps, but it often makes them feel bloated. Um, so you get kind of a double whammy with that. Um, do you have other issues or other things that you could recommend above that? that might help with the bloating that will help with constipation? Yes. There are things like Miralax is an osmotic. It pulls in um, water in there. Um, the things that cause bloating first are Miralax fiber. 
uh, supplements that cause a lot of bloating. Um, mm-hmm. Citrusel, uh, it, it does not cause as much bloating, uh, it, but it can be extremely sweet, although it doesn't have sugar in it. Uh, mm-hmm. And it comes in all these flavors. So Citrusel is one uh, option. Metamucil, it can cause a lot of bloating too. So Metamucil, uh, bulkers, uh, fibers can cause a lot of muting. Uh, just discovered a patient told me on amazon.com, there's a product called uh, Just Better. Oh. And it's tasteless. It's a white powder. It's it's inulin in it. And I've been told that doesn't cause uh, bloating. Uh, and uh, that could be an alternative. But if you have chronic bloating, despite all of these uh, measures, then cymatocone is something that is available over the counter that you can take for bloating and excessive um, gas. The the next thing, as you know, Jen, uh, we haven't touched on this. You work with excellent naturopaths. Yeah. Uh, And um, this is tied directly into nutrition and food intake. So a nutritionist and a naturopath, and you have a work with some fantastic people, you have lectures by them, would be someone I would love to send my patients to see if they have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, et cetera, that can um, make constipation worse. I didn't touch on that, but ABDA, I believe, has resources if you'd like to speak to some of that. Yeah, and, um, you know, I I would reiterate sometimes, you know, you know, I'm sort of of the theory that sometimes food is medicine and that a nutritionalist and a, um, who can speak to that because you can take care of some of this, uh, you know, some of these issues with your gut through what you're putting in your gut. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, we are a resource. If you are looking for somebody who nutritionally, you want to like talk about diet and we do have some lectures and we've got a pamphlet on it. So, um, so these kind of things can actually help you make you feel better without going to medications first. So try that, trying that first, changing your diet. So that is absolutely true. Um, Okay, so we had a couple of questions about breathlessness. Is kind of breathlessness, a, is, is that part of dysautonomia um, and heart rate changes and um, not increasing properly? Is that part of this whole system? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the, or the, the, the moving your diaphragm uh, to external stimuli uh, and heart rate variation is an intrinsic part of the autonomic nervous system. The brainstem, uh, which has uh, some of the cells that originate the autonomic st- uh, nervous system, have carbon dioxide receptors as well. And you know, when carbon dioxide goes up, your chest moves heavily up and up and down, trying to expel the carbon dioxide. It's an automatic reaction. And so that is automatic, autonomic, automatic. Um, and, um, and, and so is a heart rate variability. It absolutely is. And these are problems more in multiple system atrophy, unfortunately, more than Parkinson's disease, mm-hmm. is when the nuclei in the brainstem are degenerating in MSA, which happens more common than PD, the, the, the stimulus or the push to the diaphragm to move up and down is not there. So people start retaining carbon dioxide. When you retain carbon dioxide, you get a condition called hypercarbia, which can cause brain fog. And if in higher quantities, uh, it's almost like CO2 poisoning, uh, you can even slip into unconsciousness. And that is the extreme scenario. But in Parkinson's disease, you can. I didn't show a slide, which I thought I'd reserve for an an another lecture called non-motor fluctuations. So we have a lot of patients come in who at the end of the dose wearing off of levodopa become short of breath or start hyperventilating. And we do believe that that could be a sign of wearing off of the medication. So that needs to be taken into account. And any time you have autonomic or any other symptom in Parkinson's disease, which is rhythmic, which is cyclical, and there is a pattern to it, which coincides with when you take your medications, that's a huge clue to the patient and the physician that we got to look at the way the medications are being dosed. Mm -hmm. So 
utilizing a piece of paper to track your symptoms and your your when your on and off times are for a little bit, particularly before you see the physician, or using something like the APDA symptom tracker, which is an app on your phone that you can track how things are going and you can communicate with your doctor that way. That those do you find as a physician, those are valuable tools for you? exceptionally valuable because mm-hmm. there is nothing out there uh, that we uh, that, that we can do you know other than the patients monitor themselves uh, at home uh, we mm-hmm. see the patients for 30 minutes which is a snapshot the patients yeah. live with their disease all their life and they are truly the experts in their disease yeah. what we have to do is separate the wheat from the chaff in the clinic um, you mm-hmm. know what, what is relevant, what is not, but tracking your symptoms. But you also don't have to become very OCD about tracking your symptoms and make Excel spreadsheets and pie graphs and all of that. <laughs> uh, people do that. Uh, and that becomes a little too much. But just recognizing a pattern, uh, you know, is a, is a very big clue. And that app track, the app that you mentioned, I think mm-hmm. that's tremendously helpful. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, because I counsel people to do that. So (laughs) that is good. Um, So on heart rate, if you're having issues with your heart rate and and um, but exercise, we know is so critical in Parkinson's disease. Are there special considerations you should take if you're wanting to exercise, but you're also having heart rate issues? Absolutely. Because heart rate variability and heart disease is so ubiquitous, so common that the first thing you got to do is see a cardiologist absolutely okay. right away and then put Parkinson's disease uh, in, in the background and the foreground is heart disease. And it is very important to talk to the cardiologist to see if it is a treatable cause of heart rate variability. And that can be a dangerous problem because it can cause arrhythmias uh, and a whole bunch of other things. So at that point, we must partner with a cardiologist. Okay. Okay. Few more questions. Yeah. That's um, the heart really. Yeah. You got to keep track of that. Um, overactive bladder. Um, what is the natural course of overactive bladder from PD if left untreated? Does it usually get worse over time? Yes, it can because the nerves begin to degenerate, but treating it also doesn't prevent the nerves from degenerating. Treating it is symptomatic treatment, which Mm -hmm. is quality of life. But here's the other issue, and I didn't talk about that. Um, Overactive bladder and urinary retention uh, can cause urinary tract infections, Mm -hmm. um, which can cause sepsis, which can be deadly. So it is important to ensure that bladder problems be treated, not as much uh, in overactive bladder, but uh, but uh, in urinary retention, when you're not able to, uh, to uh, basically excrete or avoid. Uh, overactive bladder is a big, big problem with quality of life. I mean, mm-hmm. about traveling, camping, hiking, et cetera. We have all these ads on TV that yeah. illustrate what happens when you have an overactive bladder. But in the context of Parkinson's disease, it's relevant because it's a, it's a fairly common problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this this question, it's kind of well, they are telling they're having issues with um, with urinary problems, but the bladder tests with retention and emptying their urologist said everything is normal, but they're still having these issues. So where do you go from there? Uh, that's a good question. I would I would have the neurologist call the urologist and say, can you explain uh, this test to me? Because a patient continues to have spasms, et cetera. Then mm-hmm. the doctor needs to communicate with the doctor and potentially a trial of medications that reduces bladder spasticity or hyperactivity is warranted because tests are not always 100% accurate all the time. Mm-hmm. It's the clinical symptom that matters. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we, we probably need to look at the nerves coming into the bladder from the spinal cord. Is this a spinal cord issue? There are many other reasons for the bladder uh, to either overact or underact. Uh, but the very fact that the patient is having the issue despite a normal test, it, it merits attention. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, 
So something that we haven't really talked about, but there's a couple of questions on opposite ends of this, which is temperature regulation. Somebody asked, why am I always so cold as I'm getting wearing off? And someone else is talking about kind of the heat that we're having and how it's really impacting them and that they're having difficulty. Can you address any of that? Yes. Again, very common in all autonomic conditions. Parkinson's disease is just one. Multiple system atrophy, pure autonomic failure, Lewy body dementia, all cause problems with temperature regulation because the hypothalamus is affected. And mm-hmm. that's where temperature regulation comes from. And the nerves from the hypothalamus are the ones that come down into the spinal cord and then leave and then regulate our sweat glands. And so this is really important that those are the very nerves that are affected. And as you know, in this weather, if you don't sweat, you overheat. You have to sweat and then cool off in order for your core temperature to go down. Mm-hmm. And then it is also important to recognize that uh, the body heat is generated in various complex mechanisms. Um, you know, it you require a certain amount of fat and muscle in order to generate that, but it is regulated by neurotransmitters as well. And those neurotransmitters are the ones that are part of the autonomic nervous system that are talking to your organs. So it is true that this is a common problem in Parkinson's disease. Unfortunately, there aren't a great lot of drugs that have been and um, designed to treat this problem specifically. So the treatment would be number one, if it's a cyclical problem, as I said, you know, that is happening right around the time when you're taking the medication is to talk to the doctor to make sure that the patient is not wearing off mm-hmm. before the next dose is due. So that's number one. But if it's random, not cyclical, and it is very temp- external temperature dependent, then you have no choice but to ensure either you are wearing warm clothes or you're wearing lighter clothes. Uh, and you're, you're appropriately modulating the external temperature because we don't have medications to modulate the internal temperature when our internal thermostat is off. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Just four more questions are here. Um, oh, is dry mouth a symptom of dysautonomia? Yes. Yes, okay. because the so, autonomic yes. nerves uh, control secretions from the parotid and the submandibular gland. It is a symptom of dysautonomia, but the most common cause of dry mouth in the world is medications. Okay. Yes. And we have a pamphlet on your oral health, and we did a webinar on... Um, keeping a healthy mouth not too long ago that's on our YouTube channel that was terrific. So if you are experiencing that, there are a lot of suggestions in that webinar and in that pamphlet that we have. So just email me and I'll send you the link Um, or call me. Um, Is dysphagia an autonomic issue? Um, It can be, but a lot of the dysphagia that occurs in Parkinson's disease is from a dysfunction of the muscles of, of, um, uh, off uh, the lar- laryngeal area, uh, which mm-hmm. can be improved even with optimizing levodopa function. Mm-hmm. Uh, dysphagia is basically difficulty with swallowing, and it's usually the it's called the bolus phase. There again, steps in swallowing. Uh, it's a yeah. complex process. We have a great pamphlet. Or we have a great booklet on that. So um, and I've got some great speech and language therapists who do things online. So you don't even have to go out of your house to do speech and language. So, you know, we've, we've got some resources for those. You for know, sure. you kindly share those with us because our, um, mm-hmm. this is off topic, but it is important. Our schedulers are finding it difficult for our patients to find such specialists, particularly when they're not able to drive places, or maybe I can just have the patients call you guys, if that's okay for that. Of course, of course, send them to us and we'll, hook them up. And if we can't find anybody, we'll keep searching. So we will do that. Jen, you have a webinar for each question. It's terrific. Right. I know. Seriously, there's a webinar for this. So (laughs) um, two super random last questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, uh, Someone's husband was um, prescribed Philomax before he was diagnosed with PD. Is that an okay thing to continue taking? It's okay thing to continue taking. Flomax is very commonly used, but if you're having foggy headedness, if you're having problems thinking, et cetera, then you may need to take stock of Flomax and other medications that can cause it, but it's perfectly okay to continue taking it. Okay. And have you ever heard of a mobile app called Cardia 
that tracks yes. blood pressure and heart rate. Yes. Do you they recommend it? It's, I don't have it personally, but some of my patients are using it now. Patients have this interesting ring. It's very mm. expensive. It's like 190. It's a very expensive ring. Oris or O. It starts yeah, yeah, yeah. O, I've heard of it. Mm-hmm. And we're just wearing that ring. And I don't know how accurate just wearing a ring is in terms of getting your blood pressure and heart rate. So again, when you're using uh, the, these devices, please have them calibrated because, uh, you know, and, and measured against a gold standard. Uh, mm-hmm. To make sure that they're giving you accurate reading, this particular ring allows you to measure sleep and heart rate and blood pressure and all that. There was one final question that talks about truncal dystonia. Uh, there you oh, go. Oh yeah, that aura. just came in. The aura, aura ring. Yeah. Okay. Ask your questions. <laughs> that's the. <laughs> yeah, that, and the Apple the... Watch tracks some heart rate and stuff yes. like that. I have that, but again, calibrate it. Make sure it's accurate. I take it with a with a grain of salt. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Anyways, truncal dystonia is not mm-hmm. common in a dysautonomia. It's a very complex problem. Uh, and then I'll be happy to talk about, and I think Jen has a webinar on this too, dystonia in Parkinson's disease. Uh, but if you don't have a webinar, Jen, then you can call on us to, to make a lecture on dystonia specific to Parkinson's disease because it's a very common problem. And by the way, it is quite treatable. Yeah, I was thinking about something like the two D's of Parkinson's, dyskinesias and dystonia. I don't know if they belong together in a webinar, they do. but they absolutely do. Then we should do that in the future, PK. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yes. All right. So that was we are wrapping it up. Um, so for those of you that are still here, which a lot of you are still here, which is terrific. When you exit, you're going to see popping up on your screen, something to take a survey. We would love to know how your experience is with this. I will also put a link to that in your post event email. There's a lot of things I'm going to put in your post event email at this point. I'm making all these lists. I'm going to send you the video of this. I'm going to send you um, the slides that were presented. I'm going to send you some links to um, like that webinar that that gastroenterologist did, um, which I'm also going to send to you, Dr. Kamani. Um, I'm also going to send you some information about our APDA Optimism Walk, which is on Saturday, October 1st. Um, If you're in the Seattle area, it's going to be an in-person walk. If you're not in the Seattle area, you can still participate. We have lots of ways to get involved. So I'm going to send you a link to that. Um, We're very excited to get together in person, outdoors, do a walk, build community together, um, and raise money for the work that we are doing to bring you these programs and services. So so look for your post-event email. And uh, I want to thank again, Kiawa Kieran for sponsoring this event. And I want to thank you, Dr. Kamani, for um, all of the information you shared today. It is a complex, well, Parkinson's is super complex. Dysautonomia is super complex, these changes. and But there are things you can do about it. And I appreciate you se- talking not about the doom and gloom, but also what it, what you can do to impact quality of life. Because I know that's what you are all about in your clinic and treating patients. And it's also what APDA is all about. We can't take Parkinson's away yet, but we can give you tools to live your best life with it. So that's what we're all about. So um Thank you for your time in this. And thanks for being a great friend to us. And any parting words for our audience? Uh, no, I think you said it really well. Um, I would I would only say have a great summer. Stay cool. And again, yes. hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Hydrate. I was going to say hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. So stay cool and stay hydrated. So those are our parting words for you. And move your body too. I think it's good to, you know, Keep moving as well. So hey, uh, you've got an optimizing optimism walk coming in. Things are going to be cooler then. Yes, they will be. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, take care, everyone, and thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll see you again on a next program, or maybe in person on October first. So, thank you so much, and take Bye, care. Guys. Have a great afternoon.